So welcome. Um, thank you for coming here. Um, I'm Peter Eisenschild. I'm a longtime Postgres developer. Work at Second Quadrant. We do Postgres development services. And this is um, something I've been looking into a little bit lately. And uh, so I want to give a little bit of a introduction to graph databases, just as a partially as a just a general sort of education about this other world of uh, data management. That's potentially interesting to practitioners, but also there's some uh, things happening that are potentially interesting for Postgres uh, future development. Okay. Maybe a, a question to the room. Who has used uh, a, graf a graph database system uh, before? Okay, a few, okay. So, so that's a graph. All right, so uh, the terms uh, that are being used, uh, a graph consists of uh, vertices and edges. That's probably something you've heard of and from uh, sort of ma ma mathematical definition. So these are the, the vertices and then the edges in between them. Uh, vertices are also called nodes. It's the same thing. Edges are also called, uh, in a graph database world, edges are also called relationships. That, that makes sense if you consider how they're used, but it's probably a little bit confusing uh, if you come from relational databases. So I, I'm not gonna use that word, but that's something you will find in, in some products. And sometimes they're also called arcs. So those are all respectively the same. I, I'm just pr mostly saying nodes and edges because that's easiest to pronounce, but they're all the same. So this is a, a directed graph. Um, every edge has a direction. In, in graph databases, that's more or less implicit, so it uh, doesn't have to be mentioned explicitly. Also note, perhaps, that in, in, a, in a graph database, uh, you can have multiple edges between the same nodes. That's maybe not always the case in certain mathematical models, but in, in data representation, that's entirely permissible. All right, so this is a graph with some stuff on it, some text, some data, and you can see that there's data being stored here, right? Maybe it's a little bit too tiny to, to read all the details, but uh, there's some this is a person with a name. This is an account with a number. This person is the owner of this account. And there's transactions between different accounts. Uh, here, in this case, there are multiple transactions, so it makes sense to have multiple edges. This is a person who has a, is an owner of this account. And this person works for this company who is the owner of this account, and so on. So th this is, is called a property graph. And that's a term of art that, that you, will, uh, you will see in this world. Uh, and uh, the, 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 uh, the sort of the pieces of information on this graph are called properties and labels. So the, the bold things, if you, if you can see that, those are the labels. And if you want to map that maybe to a sort of a, something you will know from a relational database, you can think of the, the label as being sort of the type of the, of the node. So this is a person, this is a person, this is a person, this is an account, this is an account, this is an account. And then the properties are sort of the column values if you, that, that are specific to that instance, right? So here's a particular name of a person, particular name, particular name. So those are, and, and a, pro, a property graph also that look, works like this is also sometimes called the labeled property graph. That, that's more or less equivalent. And, and depending on what system you use or what specific implementation choices you make in a system, uh, it, this could be strongly typed or weakly typed or not typed at all, or it could have a schema or no schema. It could be just a system where you can add any properties you want to anything, then you have a very sort of free system, and then you have the usual problems and that you don't really know what the data is in there, right? Or you can have a, a sort of a strong schema kind of approach, and then the, the label would then determine what kind of properties are allowed in that node, for example. So, there are different choices you can make in that world, just like in a, in a relational document store or things like that. So the abbreviation for property graph is what? It's, it's PG, <laughs> OK? So that's uh, super, con super confusing if you go to sort of a, a, a information about the graph databases. You will see PG everywhere. And it's like, OK. So. <laughs> That's, 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 that's a standard term. So this is a different way to do graph data that uh, you might have heard of, RDF. 
It's sort of a, a web technology. Comes sort of from the semantic web world and is a W3C standard and is is you know it's not primarily meant to be really a graph database in a way. It's a way to do repre represent knowledge really, but you can think about it as a graph. And uh, the way RDF represents data is so-called triples that consists of subject, predicate, object. So in this example, you have. And because this is sort of a web technology, all the, the facts are represented as URLs. So you have URLs that refer to other URLs, uh, to other URLs, or at the sort of the leaf of these, you have uh, at these, uh, um, uh, what are they called again? Uh, this sort of scalar values. They have it, forgot the term right now. Um, and the, the way that the sort of conventional way to represent it in the graph is that the URLs are in, in these uh, ellipses and the so that the scalar values are in boxes, but that's just a convention. And, uh, and so, um, and uh, this is um, just a different way to do it. And it, it, you don't have any uh, sort of properties on this, so, but you can sort of arrange your data differently so that instead of having properties on nodes, you just have additional edges to these uh, values, right? So you, you, there is a sort of a transformation necessary between uh, those two different approaches. And uh, this is kind of a, the, uh, the fundamental uh, uh, problem, perhaps, in, in the graph database world, that the, uh, the property graph and the RDF approaches are basically not interoperable. Right? They, are, they both have the same computational power, or however you want to put it, or you can represent any data any way you want, but they don't interoperate in terms of the ecosystems. And there are ways to sort of convert one to the other in sort of ad hoc ways and, and stuff like that, but there's no principled sort of ma mapping mechanism between them. And so, and this is sort of there's research going on how to do that, but it's very deep and, and complicated. And, and so, but uh, sort of from a practical point of view, when you go into this realm of graph databases or you talk to people or you perhaps engage with some, you know, go into the forum or engage with consultants or anything like that, you have to be clear on what side of the fence you want to operate, okay? And I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about this in detail uh, so here. So um, this is sort of a way to contrast those two sides, right? Um, the, as I mentioned, RDF is a, is a web, uh, sort of came from sort of the web uh, technology, the semantic web is kind of the, uh, uh, the sort of the, the keyword there, perhaps. So it's standardized in W3C. You can you know, look that up, and, and it's uh, um, quite accessible. Uh, property graphs are currently being standardized uh, in ISO, and I'll have more details on that later. The languages are different. So some of these, I'll go into more detail on some of these, but some of these you might have heard of, some of these not, and you can also see that there's a lot of sort of <laughs> A few letters in different permutations to make different language names, right? Um, in, in terms of the sort of serialization formats or how is this usually represented, uh, web technologies uh, obviously use uh, this kind of stuff typically. Uh, RDF, maybe some of you think of RDF uh, is also is, is sort of uh, the, f uh, the foundation of RSS, for example, and other things like that. So some of them. Uh, some of you might think of RDF ac actually sort of as an XML vocabulary. That's also a valid way to look at it. There, but there are also other serialization formats, and there's some JSON formats, for example, that uh, are uh, standardized for that. On the property graph world, it's more like uh, kind of how it is in, in relational databases. CSV is used a lot, but you can basically make up your own, right? So it's very similar to that. There's a... Uh, a couple of vendors, I mean, obviously there's others, but just so you can maybe have heard of some of these. Um, so Neo4j is a, is a very uh, a big uh, a vendor of, of uh, a graph database product. Oracle is doing something like World. Tiger Graph is, is a company that is doing, uh, has a product. AWS has a service, AWS um, Neptune, that's their, their product that actually is on both sides here, right? And it's also interesting, you, on, on, on Neptune, you can choose if you want to have a property graph or an RDF database when you create the instance, but you can't switch between them like at runtime, right? So the, the underlying 
in engine can apparently do both, but you have to kind of choose at, at the beginning of how, what you want to do with it. On the RDF side, uh, there's a com company called uh, Virtuoso that, that's quite popular. There's various Apache projects that, uh, that um, implement this. Uh, and uh, there's actually sort of many more because you can actually kind of do a kind of a light implementation uh, of that. And uh, so something I'm not listed here because it's kind of hard to, to pinpoint, or, but roughly speaking, without you know, sort of uh, you can RDF is often used more in a in a sort of a researchy environment, you could say, and property graphs more in a business context. Okay, and both of those sides are going to uh, like dispute that. But that's at least sort of a rough guideline of where this is coming from, okay? So, and, uh, and there's sort of an inter interesting um, uh, sort of fa fact or concept uh, uh, that sort of also supports that is that there's a difference between the uh, the way the language logic is designed of a, a so-called closed world assumption and an open world assumption. So what does that mean? Um, in a, in a in a if you have a language or a sort of a, a system of logic in that's uh, called a closed world, that means um, everything that's in your database is true, and everything that's not in your database is false. Whereas in an open world assumption is Everything that's in your database is true, and everything that's not, you don't know. For example, we have a schedule for this conference, and it says at 10 o'clock in this room, there's this talk. And on Saturday at 10 o'clock, there's nothing in the database, so there is no talk. Whereas in an, that's the closed world assumption. In an open world assumption is on Saturday, there is at 10 o'clock, there's nothing there, so we don't know. There might be something. We just have to gather more information about that. Okay. And and this, both of that makes sense if you consider the context in which it is used. In a in a in a, in a business database, the, the facts in the database are the authority of what's going on, right? If you have a a reservation in a hotel and it's not in a database, it doesn't exist, right? Then you don't have one. Whereas if you if you do a, sort of a, the way RDF is used is more like the, the, the also so sort of thinking about the semantic web is you want to collect as much information about the world as you can, but it's never going to be complete. So you have some facts and you can make conclusions, but you don't have all the facts, right? And so if you want to, if you, there might be gaps in your knowledge, so you have to collect more information, right? So this is especially interesting in things like bioinformatics. If you if you sort of collect facts about diseases or proteins or, or you know things like that, you you will, you collect facts about the world, but your database is not the authority on what the facts of the world are. You just have some knowledge, and maybe you don't have all of it, and, and so you got to collect more information. So um, the so th that has sort of interesting consequences actually in logic for example let's say you have a database uh, that stores family relationships for example and you have a sort of parent child relationships and stuff like that and you have a unique constraint that says one person can have at most one biological father for example and then you have a record in your database that says Bob is the father of Alice in your database, and then you have a new record coming in from, from your database, uh, from your uh, ingesting in your database that says Robert is the father of Alice. In a closed world uh, uh, logic system, then you would get the unique constraint violation that says you, know, you can't put that in. You already have something. In an open world logic system, you uh, new facts cannot invalidate old facts, but so both of this would be accepted. But then you can make conclusions from that. Because you have this unique constraint, but you have these two records, then you can conclude, well, then Bob must be the same person as Robert. Okay. So that kind of can, that kind of thing can be useful. So, but I think it is clear to everyone by now that in the world that we are operating in, it's really this kind of system that is more sort of close to what we're working with. So, and this is 
very useful, but really a little bit beyond of what we're doing. So I'm going to, in for the rest of the talk, mostly focus on this. And this is going to be something else, OK? And just this thing down here, just to clarify, GraphQL is not a graph query language, OK? That's just, it's a, it's a, that's a lie, OK? It's, it's a way to design API, web APIs or, or something like that. And it's also very popular and useful, but it has nothing to do with this, just to, to clarify that, OK? So graph database uses, I alluded to a couple uh, just now. So the, the, the canonical examples that, uh, well, if you ask uh, graph database practitioners or vendors, they're going to say, well, graph databases are useful for everything, and you should use them all the time. <laughs> Fair enough. But so the canonic canonical examples that are always given are sort of uh, social network graphs or recommendation systems, like this person recommended that, who also recommended that, and this person has bought this and stuff like that. That's obviously a graph, right? And that's true. The, it seems like the graph database vendors, they kind of hate that because it kind of, uh, you know, kind of constrains their messaging. It's always that, right? And uh, they kind of want to break out of that a little bit. But that, those are certainly useful things. But there's w certainly other uh, popular use cases. Uh, knowledge representation is more like the semantic web that I uh, explained. Also, bioinformatics, where you collect facts about the world that are linked. But anything like in, in sort of where the, the, the facts are kind of a graph, like logistics, right? This goes to there, and then it has to go to there, and that kind of stuff, or any kind of representat representation of infrastructure, power grids, or, or spread of diseases, and, and things like that you can do. Uh, access control is also useful um, because you have, I mean, you can even do this in, in, in Postgres, right? You have like this role is granted to that role, who's granted to that role, who's granted to that role. And this can do that, and that guy can also do that. And then you want to do some kind of compliance check on that. It's like, who could have actually done that? Who has access to all that over there through all these hops? That's a graph problem, right? And also very uh, popular is, is sort of finance related things. And this is kind of the example I had earlier where, let's kind of go back really quick. Right, here is all kinds of money flowing around, and then you can ask, you can kind of do a fraud detection kind of thing. If money is flowing around in circles, that's possibly suspicious. Not an expert on that, but that's the kind of stuff that people do, right? If, if money seems to be flowing in, in circles for no particular reason all the time repeatedly, that, that's something you can uh, draw conclusions from, right? So those are some applications that uh, are popular still. So. That's sort of the, the basics. Now I want to go through some language details, because that's kind of what uh, we are about, right? So any kind of questions on the general concepts, perhaps, at this point? Okay. So this is a Sparkle. This is a query language for RDF. And it's, in a way, the standard query language. So unlike the property graph side, well, there are a couple more ways you can interact with RDF, certainly. But this is the way to go. And as you can see here, we don't need to go into details of all of this. I'm just going to kind of see what it, show you where this is going. As you can kind of see here, this is kind of an unholy mix of uh, XML URLs and uh, SQL-like syntax. Uh, so th what this is kind of means, I mean, there is sort of a, a, an ontology here that explains what the data means. And these things with question marks are um, variables that are bound at runtime. And so this, what this query does is like, OK, sh remember, these are triple subject, predicate, object. So subject, predicate, object, subject, predicate, object. Right, so this like, find me some x that is a city. And, um, and that is a capital. And then find me the x that is the capital of something, and then that something, which is the Y, also should be in a country. And then check that the country also find a fact that that country is in Africa, for example. Right? So what this query essentially does is find me all the capitals of African countries. You can do this in the relational database, certainly. And uh, the, the, the neat thing here is essentially, if you think about it, sometimes uh, users send in sort of questions of, well, I have these tables, and they're linked by foreign keys. So why don't they just? Why don't you join them automatically? It's a reasonable thing, thing to think about. It's not how SQL works, but you can. You know, this kind of essentially does that, right? 
if you do a if you do a if you represent this in a relational table, you could do okay. I have a city table, I have a capital table, I have a country table, I have a continent table, something like that. And basically, this automatically joins this implicitly. Not exactly like that, but that's kind of the idea, right? So that's RDF. Again, not going to go into more uh, uh, stuff about RDF, but uh, that that's absolutely widely used. Um, it also has sort of nice features that you can federate things that, because again, there are actually a lot of sort of public RDF databases available that are you know, published by research institutions. Here's, here's all the data we have about this particular subject matter. And then here's some other, other research institution perhaps that has other, more data about that and you can then link them together and it's kind of really made for that sort of semantic web idea. Okay. But this is more like a query language that doesn't do any like transactions or, or data definition or anything like that, right? That's, it's really just querying. So, this is uh, a um, property graph query language. Uh, it's called Cypher, and this is not standardized, but it's the most popular one by being the most popular one. Right? Uh, so this is kind of how that looks. And again, you can see there's some sort of looks a little bit like an SQL sort of at least lexical structure, but the details are sort of the same. So what does this do? So remember, that there's nodes and edges, and so this is looking for, it's, it's the match keyboard kind of indicates I'm looking for a match of, a, of an arc in a way. So I'm looking for an actor, I, I'm looking for a node with a label actor that is connected somehow with a node of the label movie. I'm gonna bind that to these variables, and the actor node should have the name property, Nicole Kidman, and the edge should be, have the label acted in. So in other words, this looks for, look, look for all the movies that Nicole Kidman has been in, right? And then you can do other, sort of then these variables are bound to when the match happens. And then you can do other things here, the aware clause, or um, you know, there's other, depending on how to what extent you implement this, you can then do grouping or, or other filtering or transformations. And then you have the, re uh, the uh, return clause here. So this kind of works backwards from SQL. You, uh, uh, perhaps almost like a better design, right? So in SQL, really, you start sort of with the from clause. Implementation-wise, you start with the from clause, and then you do various filtering and grouping, and then you actually do the select list, right? So it's written sort of backwards from the way it actually works. This actually is a little more logical in that sense. You first find stuff, then you do some filtering, and then you say what columns you want to return. And it's also more consistent. Let's say I w instead of returning, I can also delete it or change it. So it would then be match something, wear something, delete. Match something, wear something. Um, it's not update, but it's called set in that case. So I could say set some other parameter, on, and I would then update that node. So it's, it's a reasonably uh, well designed. Okay, so that's Cypher again, that's very popular. It's, it's from this product Neo4j, which is very popular, but it's also, uh, there's an opencypher.org where they kind of publish it as a sort of a community standard in a way. And there's other products that implement that as well. For example, there's actually an extension for Postgres that does that. And there's also an extension for a sort of plugin for Redis, for example, where you can do that. So then would actually just use that on top of and then translate it internally to whatever the native query language is. All right. That's uh, Cypher. This is PGQL. Okay, again, the letters are here slightly confusing. Uh, PGQL is a query, graph query language that Oracle is developing. <laughs> uh, a property graph query language is a, re a reasonable uh, choice of names to make, right? And this is also, uh, uh, an open standard in a way that's pgql-lang.org where this is specified and others are free to implement this as well. And in a way, it does the same thing. Just the syntax is different, more like SQL, right? So you, you start from some graph, you have the match, cl match clause here, which you know, looks quite similar. So we have, a, this, this refers back to that initial graph about the financial transaction. So we're starting with that financial transaction graph. We're looking for a person who's the owner of an account who's had a transaction 
with another account where uh, some other person is the owner of. So who has wired money to whom? Gra uh, Greg, please. Let me answer that just in a moment, yes. So the question for the microphone was whether this can be used on top of the normal Oracle database or whether there's a separate uh, system for that, okay. Yeah, just, right. One more, yeah, so, ba yeah, so basically this is how that works. Again, you can see there's sort of an SQL element to this. It's not SQL though. So to answer your question, the way this is works in Oracle is that there's a separate product, and the letters are going to be funny again. There's a separate product, which is called PGX, <laughs> which is, uh, as far as I understand, you can import data into via some ETL or whatever they have there. And then you can use that language on this specialized graph store, which is presumably optimized for that. Yeah. But again, this language is open. Um, uh, but so this is something that is out there now in, in uh, official use. I have some links later, obviously this will be posted, some of those links to all of this. And most of the examples here I actually kind of more or less copied from these uh, reference documentation so you can, if you want to know more about what the actual details of all these are, you can easily re refer to that. All right, and then there's the sort of the third major one, perhaps G-Core. So there is a, uh, so a, a multi-fold uh, origin story here, I guess. Uh, there is an organization called LDBC, which stands for Linked Data Benchmark Council. So nothing to do with JDBC, ODBC, uh, but Linked Data Benchmark Council. Linked data is also essentially a synonym for graph, right? You'll see this LD sometimes. There's also a standard, for example, called JSON-LD, which is a JSON representation of RDF, so st stuff like that. And so that, was originally sort of, I think it was EU uh, 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 research grant uh, founded uh, organization that to develop a uh, benchmarks for graph databases or graph query language in a, as a sort of an independent effort. And then they founded this nonprofit, which is, I have the link later, you can, you can access that. So that's how that organization was founded. Um, they had sort of two problems to solve. So that those benchmarks are available and you can join that organization to get access to some of those details. Um, but they had sort of two problems to solve. One is how do you actually specify the benchmark uh, if you don't have a common language for all of it, right? There's so many different languages. So they came up with a, with a sort of an abstract language perhaps. This is not implemented anywhere but this is, a, well specified, perhaps. So sort of an abstract query language that want th that defines what the benchmarks are and then it can be translated into different actual languages. And it actually the LDBC benchmarks as they're implemented also work on Postgres, for example. They just use recursive queries and stuff like that. And actually Postgres performs actually quite well on that. So Postgres actually does support some graph stuff quite well. So that was that. The second part is that the query language like this takes a graph, looks for some stuff, and then actually returns a table. It doesn't return a graph, right? Ultimately, it prints out columns just like PSQL would do. Same here, right? You do some stuff in a graph, but you get a table back. And so these languages are not either at all or fully what's called composable. So this, you, in, in, in uh, SQL, you can certainly compose queries almost arbitrarily. You can make subselects and you can do unions and like every part of the system returns either a, a, a table or a, a scalar, right? And then if it returns a table, you can bind it with other tables through joins or unions or, or, or filtering. It's always a table somehow in the conceptual processing model. This is not necessarily the ca case here, and there are some you know, open questions of how to do that, and they basically then solve that and, and de 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 devise a query language that is uh, supposed to be fully composable. And so there is research papers out there exactly of how they do that and stuff like that. There's gonna be a link later, but 
that is sort of the twofold uh, purpose of G-Core. That is uh, a composable query language, but also a way to like, specify these benchmarks. So, and then there's another one which I mentioned earlier in the, in the table, GSQL, which is all, all and so there, there might be more of these, but these are sort of the three big ones, I guess, that people are looking at right now. And then somebody said, well, I, there's too many. Let's put them all together, right? <laughs> which is presumably how SQL got started many, many years ago. <coughs> so this started a couple of years ago where people from essentially Neo4j sort of ask the community, like, we have these query languages, should we kind of figure out how to put them all together? This is a reasonable question to ask, and there's a website with the manifesto, so it was all quite kind of fancy, and, and they, they're proposing to merge in a way to be determined these query languages of basically the two major vendors plus sort of the leading research group in this field to make a new language which would be called GQL. Right. And so here's a graph that, uh, that, that sort of a sketch, a chart, and illustration that is from that website that uh, sort of to support that effort and then build some uh, enthusiasm around. And actually, it shows some interesting sort of differences in between these different languages. Uh, for example, to come back to Gre Greg's point, PGQL currently is, is read-only, right? The data you actually you operate on is, is in your Oracle database, and then you can export that to the PGX to query it, but you can't update it there. So it's not updatable, Cypher is updatable, GCore is updatable. There's something called an RPQ, which stands for regular path query. Regular in the sense of regular language, regular expression. So you can have these kind of queries, right, where it's like this edge goes to that edge, but the regular path query would then also do uh, repetition, for example, then you could say, find me something that goes from some person to some other person by a, star hops, stuff like that, like a regular expression would do. That's obviously much harder to implement, so that's a, another feature. So some languages have that, some don't. Graph construction, I explained that, and the composability. So there's different features and, and, and things like that. So they want to build a language that is you know, fully updatable, supports RPQs, is composable, and can do graph construction. That's uh, the, the uh, idea, and this is happening like right now, basically. This, uh, the uh, GQL manifesto came out uh, a couple of years ago, and, and they've been talking, and I actually had a chance to go to one of the meetings. I was in Berlin earlier this year. I kind of sat in there a little bit and gathered a lot of that information and talked to a lot of these people to get some, see what's going on. So this is, there's, uh, I, I mentioned that uh, yesterday in my talk about the SQL standard. So there's a uh, ISO IEC Joint Technical Committee 1, Subcommittee 32, Working Group 3, called Database Languages. Right now, the only database language that that group is working on is SQL. There's going to be a meeting of that group in a couple weeks in Korea. and on the agenda is to start this new language as an official project in that working group. And it will presumably be approved, because that's obviously already arranged ahead of time. So formally, it would probably be approved, and then it goes through motions. I've seen sort of a very, very, very early draft that's just being kind of kicked around. The usual sort of work cycle there is you know, several years. There's obviously a lot of legwork to be done, and then obviously some a lot of formal work to, through the bureaucracy. So don't expect any actual output of this in, in, uh, for a few years, but it, that's going to be kicked off. Doesn't mean it will actually succeed. Who knows? That could also happen that they just end up not liking each other. Who knows? And I, I saw somewhere that might have that uh, number at some point, right? Uh, the, the, uh, the syntax in the early draft that I saw is, doesn't seem to be compatible with SQL. It, it, it will look like it in the sort of the lexical uh, structure in a way, similar to how, how some of these look here, stuff like that. But it's not going to be sort of, it's not going to be a superset or a subset of SQL, or there might not even be an overlap. So 
Right? It's not going to be C versus C++ or something like that. that. It doesn't look like that, at least currently. Okay. So again, that's happening right now. So we will we'll see how what comes out of that. Just in, I mean, in, in terms of for this group, just be aware that there's going to be sort of a, a sibling of, of SQL out there that you know might be of interest in the industry in, 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 at some point. All right. So that is the new stuff way out there. This is more happening in parallel to that, more close to home. Okay. This is separate. Technically separate, but obviously in the same realm. And then again, the naming, hilarious. <laughs> All right, uh, so this is going to be the next SQL standard version will be presumably expected to be out in 2020 or 21. There is going to be a new part 16, which is SQL slash PGQ property graph query. And this is going to be a syntax to do read-only graph queries of the nature that we just saw on top of a relational database. So you're just going to have all your tables and stuff, but you can define a structure on top of that to do queries like the ones I showed. And the way this is currently, um, so here's how that looks. So step one, you define a graph. So first you create a table, I didn't show that here, so you make tables that contain your actual data. So in this case, you would have a table called person, table called message, with whatever you want to put in there, as you would normally do. And then you have tables that connect those, like a many-to-many -many kind of table, that would create it and comment it, for example. And then you can say, the created table links this one and that one, comment and table links this one and that one. All right. And then you just have this, in a way, this is kind of a view, right? It just creates sort of a catalog object that establishes this dependency. And uh, then if you want to do a query, it would look like this. So this is actual SQL syntax that is uh, in the draft standards. And uh, I did actually implement this in the parser just to see if that would actually work. And it seems to be not too problematic. So there is this. Question? Is there a patch for that right now? Uh, locally, yes. <laughs> well, we can talk about that at the end of what we want to do with that. Obviously, that's kind of the going to be the finale here. So there would be a new uh, sort of from clause item right here that is, is graph table. This is the keyword. This is the graph we just created. So you would say, this is the graph I want to query from. This is going to be a graph table stuff in here. And then you have this match clause, which is similar to what we saw earlier. And then again, you do, I want to look for a node that is of the person label, which means it's in the person table, which is linked to a, the message, a message node, which is linked to a person node. And that person commented on the message that was created by this. So show me all the, well, re re returning. Show me all the messages with date and content of people who commented on my messages, but not for myself. That's kind of basically what this is. That was a slightly confusing way of phrasing, I'm sorry. But the syntax is quite similar to all these other ones. So there is obviously sort of a common way of doing these kind of ASCII arts and stuff like that. And it's, it's very similar. And so you can you know, do lots of graphs, and this is connected to that, and connected to that, and like some subconditions here, and th then you do some general filtering, and then you just say what columns you want to return from that. And then, of course, you can do union, group by, and all the other business down here. So a, a, a question, yeah, Pablo? Right, so the actual, the only conflict I had, I was just going to mention that, is in the just really quick hack I had to do, I had to make columns a fully reserved keyword. And I'm slightly uh, suspicious that that might actually have something to do with the postfix operators that are being discussed right now. Yeah, all right. So I might actually, if, if, that, if there is a, a, a patch or, or I, I did, I look at this like last week and I, so a lot of this stuff is like really happening right now. So if there is a patch proposal 
to remove postfix operators, perhaps I would really just put that on top of that and see if that goes away. That would probably be uh, quite a, another supporting argument, perhaps, of that. And I believe there's also uh, the row pattern recognition feature has a similar problem, I believe. Yeah, it doesn't know at this point here, right? This could be an operator or whatnot, so uh, who, yeah. Other than that, I mean, you have to, th these brackets here are not a problem. That's just another, because um, this is not a valid operator name, so that's not a problem. There is actually sort of an alternative syntax that doesn't have these brackets. That would be a conflict, uh, but it, there is no syntax conflict. You just have to do a little bit of special treatment, but it's nothing that we haven't done before, so this is really not as problematic, perhaps, as it looks, so. To, to be determined, that's okay. So that's really um, that. And um, so I would like to keep looking into this. Not gonna be my top project tomorrow, but obviously the timeline is also um, 2020, so this is certainly not a candidate for Postgres 13 or anything like that, right? Uh, but it seems maybe especially because of stuff like this, a good idea to actually see if we can implement this properly and if there's actually problems, just know about them now, see maybe work around them now or get some feedback or anything like that. So I might, you know, we, these discussions about postfix operators are, are, are certainly one way we can bring in more information about this and see if we can do at least the parsing side and obviously the implementation side is, is a wide open problem. I mean, in the, in, the, in the simplest case, you just convert this to uh, the joins in the background. If you then want to go into regular path query, which is currently not standardized in the drafts, but probably something that might come in the future, then that's a bigger problem. Right? But I think this is, uh, could be useful, you know, and I guess the overarching idea is, uh, um, uh, arguably, graph databases could be a, something that will become relevant and interesting to users, just like, you know, other document stores and things like that were in the past, and we have successfully branched out into some of those uh, fields, and this could be another interesting opportunity. So just want to get some uh, sort of information out and uh, uh, get people interested, and uh, we can start fiddling around with that a little bit. So if, if you, you know, see me posting something on the mailing list, that's kind of where this is coming from. So here's some links. And this, we'll get these slides up there, obviously. So the, a lot of this information is, you can easily find more information about this. Your RDF is on the W3 website. That's very easy. Sparkle, again, W3, Wikipedia. Cypher is well documented, really nice manual, actually. PGQL, again, this is an open standard. You can see what Oracle is doing there. GQ research paper here. All this business about GQL. Um, this was the meeting I was at in March. So there was a lot of, basically everything I just got, <laughs> I just said, yeah, I got from that meeting, okay? So a lot of stuff about graph databases from both sides of the fence. So all the meetings are open there, so you can find that. This is a presentation, or lightning talk, rather, about PGQ, and there's lots more information about that. So just get that last link, perhaps, and just explore from there. So we're two minutes away from the end, so let's just get a couple of questions. Yes, please. Uh, there is an extension uh, called, um, what is it called, Agents Graph. They've posted to news items on Postgres, and so yes, there's a, it's an open source commercial extension of Postgres, so you can get that and try it out, yes, Agents Graph. Yes, uh, Paul? Well, um, is there a way to represent recursive query or shortest path query? So these kind of things are really just sort of path matches. Specialist databases like Neo4j, they have a whole other world of uh, graph algorithms if you want to do shortest path and, and, and that business. That's really not even in their query language. It's sort of extra stuff on top of that. So there is way more out there, yeah. Um, yes, please, up here. 
uh, this will all be posted to the conference website uh, and uh, as everything today and tomorrow and uh, that usually takes a couple of days, but yes. Hi, Greg. Um, the early draft of GQL looks more like that than that. Uh, the rest of that I can tell you off the record. Uh, yes, please. Yes, if you want to put it that way, it's going to, yeah, it's, it's a way, a different way to phrase a query in a way, right? But there are some then additional opportunities later on, like regular path queries that are not, not necessarily the same as, I mean, it, it get, th this comes really like to, uh, it, if you drill down everything, every Turing complete language is the same as every other one, <laughs> and, and arguments like that, so is it really equivalent? But at the moment, it's a different way of querying stuff that might be more sort of, uh, convenient, but then there's other opportunities being opened up. Uh, maybe last question from Pablo. Uh, so, uh, is it more convenient uh, to write recursive queries within uh, GraphQL? Well, that's in the eye of the beholder, right? If this is more convenient than that, but I think this is a, is a this is kind of a nice way of <coughs> representing the actual question that the user has, as opposed to writing sort of five joins and stuff like that, right? Yeah, that's kind of where this is going, right? So did you have a follow-on question? I kind of... That was kind of it, yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it is... Uh, I can't answer that whether this is better or worse. This is basically something that the users or the market or whatever will decide, but I think it's a, it's a very... something that a lot of people are interested in right now, so we can then make our own judgment calls of whether this is relevant or not. Uh, it's 47, so uh, I think we should close uh, but you know I'll be around please ask questions uh, personally thank you